Come on, let's give Jesus the biggest applause. Come on, let's praise Him. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. Well, welcome our mayor. Welcome, Mr. Roland Tay. Thanks for being here with us. Um, I'm so glad that you're here this morning, you know, because uh, they came from Breakfast with Love, and tomorrow they're going to fly off to United Nations for some meeting, and then I will be going to Ion to have my breakfast. So praise God for you. You're always doing very important things. Hey, I want to welcome those of you. How many of you are here with us for our conference for the very first time? If that is you, could just leave up my hands. We want to welcome you. Hey, let's welcome all our friends. Praise God. It's going to be a great conference. It's going to be a great conference. This conference, other than myself, there are four other speakers. Um, Pastor Joseph Chen of YWAM is going to be here. Pastor Howe and Pastor Lear of Heart of God Church. Pastor Benny from Perth. They're going to be here today, tomorrow, as well as on Monday night for our leadership session. It's going to be great. I can feel in my spirit that God is going to move in a big way to authenticate the work that He had been doing and he is continually doing in our movement from now and beyond. So I really want us to just do that right now. Let's stretch out our hands to our neighbors on our left and right. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray that we will receive something from God uh, this morning, not just the program, but we'll receive something from the Holy Spirit. Father, we just pray right now in Jesus' name. I ask that you fill us. Lord, we long for your presence. We long to hear your word. We just ask right now in the name of Jesus. Speak straight into our hearts. In Jesus' name, everyone say, Amen. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, during one of our staff huddle, we were taught to do origami. I don't know why, perhaps the staff were all too stressed out, so we needed some senior activity to kind of like calm us down and cool us down. And we were asked to fold a particular thing. We were asked to fold this thing. Can you show on the screen, please? We were asked to fold a paper tulip. This is what we're supposed to fold. I can't show you what I folded because it was just too awesome. Can someone say amen? <laughs> so after I finished folding, what I did was that I presented this thing that I have painstakingly folded to my lovely wife. And then there were a few staff that were around us. They were wooing and they were wowing to say that I was slightly embarrassed would be the understatement of the year. So after I presented the flower to her, the next day when I saw her, I said, Darling, do you like the flower that I presented to you yesterday? To which she replied me, Yes, I love it. So the follow-up question to my question was, Since you love it so much, darling, where did you keep this flower? To which she replied me, She didn't keep it, but she threw it away. <laughs> I felt so hurt. And then I look at my wife, I said, I thought that you are a sentimental person, you will keep things as such, to which she replied me, I was a sentimental person until I marry you. <laughs> she said, now that I've learned from you, I will no longer keep things as such. I hate to admit it, but what Claudia described on me is really quite true. I remember there was this time in church, there was this sister, he presented to me a birthday gift, something quite like this, and even from the more casual observer, it's clear that this person has taken quite a lot of effort to wrap the gift. So when this gift was cruised over to my side, what I did was that I simply just, just rip it open and then I went straight for the content of the gift because as far as I am concerned, it is not the wrapping that's important, it is the content of the gift that's important. Is that true? Well, just in case you begin to judge me as somebody who is crude, not so sentimental, I want to let you know that Everything that we do in our church, it is biblical. Can someone say amen? So I have a biblical basis for doing this, all right? Now, let me share you this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is what the apostle Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The apostle Paul said this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. You see, in olden days, the people then, they would keep sacred scroll important documents, even precious matters like silver and gold into jars of clay. The focus is not on the vessel. The focus is on the treasure. The focus is never on what is external. The focus is what is within this 
just clay. That was what Paul was saying. In essence, when Paul was using this illustration, he was describing us human beings likened to jars of clay. We are simple people, God says. We are delicate, we are inexpensive, we are fragile. In fact, oftentimes, we are also easily broken. We are like jars of clay. But there is this treasure, this precious treasure. What is this treasure? The Bible said that this treasure is Jesus. It is the gospel. It is the expensive thing. So when this treasure, this Jesus, this precious gospel is placed in jars of clay, the focus is never ever on the vessel. The focus is always on the treasure. So this year, the theme for our conference is let the world see. Maybe the question that we beg to ask ourselves today is this. What are we exactly inviting the world to see? Certainly, we're not inviting the world to come and see Hope Global as good as it is. We're not inviting the world to see Hope Singapore as much as we love her. We're certainly not inviting the world to come and see you. And most of all, we're not inviting the world to come and see me. What we're inviting the world to come to see is that we're inviting the world to come to see Jesus. Can someone give me a good amen? We're inviting the world to come to see Jesus. You see, at the onset of the launch of our new movement on the 1st of October 2018, the pastors and I, we came together and there were a few absolute unchangeable that came very quickly to us. One of the absolute unchangeable that came very quickly to us is that our vision is unchangeable. Our vision had been, is, and will always be to fulfill the Great Commission. That's what we exist to do. We do many things and we seek to do many things well. In fact, we seek to do all things well. By the end of the day, our vision it is unchangeable. It had been, it is, and it will always be to fulfill the Great Commission. Our mission, what we go about doing to fulfill this vision, three things. We are here to love neighbours, make disciples, plant churches. Everybody say, we are here to love neighbours. Everybody say, love neighbours. Everybody say, make disciples. Everybody say, plant churches. So this is a thing that came very quickly to us, the pastors and I. Even though we are a launch of a new movement, we may have changed our logo, we may have kind of changed our color scheme, but some of the things doesn't change and will never change. Our vision had been, is, and will always be to fulfill the Great Commission. And how do we go about doing this? Very simply, we are here to love neighbors, make disciples, plant churches. The second thing that came very quickly to us that we deem as absolute unchangeable it's the fact that our church, our movement is based and built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. We are here to proclaim, to promote, and to preach Jesus. We're not here to tell the people about a conference. We're not here to tell the people about a program, a strategy, or even about a leader as charismatic, as powerful as he or she may be. Our church is here to preach, to promote, to proclaim the person of Jesus Christ. In essence, what we're inviting the world to experience is to experience the life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray that as we get ourselves out there, here in Singapore and all over the world, people will first and foremost see the reality of Jesus Christ and then we pray that they will come to a place where they are able to experience the power of the life-transforming gospel of Christ. That is what we really want people to see. We want the lost to be found. We want the hurting to be comforted. We want those who are purposeless to come to a place where they are envisioned with the purpose of God. We want people who have low self-esteem, they will come to a position where they're able to find their self-worth in Christ. We want the world to see loving marriages, godly families and caring communities. We want the world to see marketplace change, city transform and nations turn to Jesus. That is what we are inviting the world to see. You see, just now, in the earlier part of my talk, 
I share a verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And this letter, 2 Corinthians, is actually a letter that Paul had written to the church in Corinth. He was writing this letter to authenticate his true apostleship that comes from Jesus Christ. And Paul didn't write this to kind of like for his own sake. He wrote it for the sake of the church. Why? Because in those days, the church then, they were trusting in other false apostles. This false apostle, they were boasting about their own supernatural experiences. They were boasting about their credential. They were boasting about their eloquence. As a result, this had led quite a few people astray, away from the gospel. So here Paul wrote to the church and Paul said, hey, I'm no supernatural apostle. I'm just an ordinary person. Even though I can boast about my supernatural experiences, which I had a few, but what I'm here to do, to tell you the church in Corinth, I want to tell you about the person of Christ. Paul wanted to let the Corinth church see Jesus. This is what he wrote. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Look at what the Bible says. Paul says that for what we preach is not ourselves. We don't talk about ourselves. We don't talk about our supernatural experiences. We don't talk about our eloquence. We don't talk about our credentials. But we're here to talk about Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So Paul wanted the church to see Jesus. Just as our movement, we want the world to see Jesus. But the question that we beg to ask is this. How exactly do we do that? Is it just about being on social media? We have a fantastic social media team. But is it just about being on social media? Is it just about running a great conference? How many of you enjoyed the program this morning? The, the starting dance and the, all this was fantastic. Come on, let's give the team a big hand. Can we do that? Fantastic. Praise God for the team. But is it just about running a conference? How do we exactly want the world to see Jesus? Now go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 7 to 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Six verses in all. Let me read verse 7 for us. Listen to the reading of the Word of God. The Bible says, this is what Paul wrote, the verse we read earlier. But we have this treasure, this gospel, this precious gospel in jars of clay, delicate, fallible, fragile people like you and I to show, to let the world see that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Verse 8 to verse 9. Why don't you read in full voice space? The Bible says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Verse 10 and verse 11. Let me read. The Bible says, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Verse 11, For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that His life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Verse 12, everybody in full voice, the Bible says, So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. From these six verses, or seven, six verses, there are two things I want to unpack for you. How can you and I live our life in such a way that the world around us, in the marketplace, in our schools, in our families, in whatever country that you come from, how can the world around us see Jesus in and through us? There are two things I want to unpack for you. The first thing we can learn from these six verses, number one, we can let the world see Jesus by helping them witness the power of Christ through our weakness. We can let them witness the power of Christ through our weakness. We can live our life in such a way that the watching world can witness the power of Jesus Christ through our human weakness. In verse 7, after Paul went on to describe that we have this treasure, this precious gospel contained within fallible, weak human beings like you and I, Paul was keeping it real. For the next two verses, in verse 8 and verse 9, Paul continued to share with his audience how difficult it was for him to preach the gospel, 
how challenging it was for him to share the good news to the then world in those days. He was keeping it real. In verse 8 and verse 9, let me read for us. He said this, he said that, hey guys, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed. Sometimes we, we serve God, we are perplexed, we are lost, we are confused, but not in despair. Verse 9, we are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. So Paul openly admitted, he didn't say that serving God was like a walk in a park. He didn't say that everything was hunky-dory. He didn't say that everything was just nice and just blue. He said that there are tough times. In fact, he described it in no uncertain terms. He said, we're hard-pressed on every side, not just one side. Hard-pressed on every side. We were perplexed. We were confused. Sometimes we don't know what's going on. Verse 9, we're persecuted. We are struck down. But he said, in the midst of all this thing, we are not, we are not crushed. We're not in despair. We're not abandoned. We're not destroyed. So Paul is saying, even in the midst of weakness, God's strength sustains us. Even though we are weak, even though times are challenging, even though we are like jars of clay, but God's power sustains us. You see, friends, God's power does not only make up for our weakness. God's power comes precisely because of our weakness. God's power comes precisely because of our weakness. It is through our weakness, the world can witness the power of Christ. It's through our weakness, the world can witness the power of Christ. You know, I've been a keen learner of leadership for many years. I've read many books on leadership. I've listened to many teaching on leadership, both from a secular perspective as well as a, on the faith-based perspective. And some of these secular books tell us that if we want to be a strong leader, there are a few things. Right? You, you, you got to act confident. You got to act confident. You got to be composed. You must never, ever show your fear. You must never, ever reveal your weakness. As a strong leader, you got to be cool. You got to be composed. Never, ever show your fear to the people. Well, obviously, the Apostle Paul didn't get the, get the, the memo. Because the way he served, instead of serving from a position of strength, he kept telling people that he is weak. He is always serving from a position of weakness. In fact, oftentimes Paul would openly admit his weakness. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, he just met these people. He went to preach and he admitted it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 5, look at what he wrote. He just so open, just so out there with it. He said that, when I came to you, Corinthian church, I did not come with eloquence, or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved, I'm determined to tell you that I know nothing when I, was with you, when I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, he said, with great fear, not just fear, great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Now, friends, why was Paul so open about it? Admitting his weakness. Maybe he's not Chinese. We are Chinese. We want to save face. Can someone say amen? But Paul is just so open about I came with you. I wonder how many conference speakers you know today will come to a stage and say, hey, I'm very scared, you know. I'm coming here to preach. I'm, I'm trembling. Why was Paul so out there with his fear? Why would he want to do it? Well, verse 5 gives us the answer. He said, I'm doing it so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So that through my weakness, you are able to witness the power of Christ. The world boasts of their strength, their wealth, their intelligence, their ability. But as Christ's follower, we boast about Jesus Christ. Can someone give me a good amen? We boast about Jesus. Now, let me just say openly, every one of us have weaknesses. Would you agree with me? From our mayor here in the front, the most powerful person here. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, Pastor Daniel, the most powerful person here. <laughs> to the rest of us, young and old, rich and poor, Man or woman, boy or girl, the fact of the matter is this. Now listen, every one of us have weaknesses. Be it intellectual weaknesses, be it 
emotional weaknesses, spiritual weaknesses, physical weaknesses, we all have weaknesses. So the question we must not ask ourselves today is, do I have weaknesses? Because that is a given. The question we should ask ourselves is this, what do I do with my weaknesses? While some of us may be tempted to deny it, to defend it, to cover them, to excuse them, but what the Word of God teaches us this day. Now listen, the Word of God teaches us this day that we are to acknowledge and admit our weakness because it is precisely through our weakness the world, they are able to witness the power of God. It is through our weakness the world can witness the power of God. Some call it the witness of weakness. Lovely. The witness of of weakness. John Stock was a notable leader of the worldwide evangelical movement. In 2005, he was voted by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people on planet Earth. After he passed on in July 2011, at the age of 90 years old, Time magazine once again wrote a piece to remember him, and I quote, one of the world's most influential and popular evangelical figures, unquote. Recently, I read his testimony, and this is what he had to say. He said that once, when I was to preach in the University of Sydney, I lost my voice, he said. What can you do with a preacher who has no voice? We had come to the last night of the evangelistic meeting the students had booked the big university hall. A group of students gathered around me and I asked them to pray for me as Paul did that this thorn in the flesh might be taken from me. But we went on to pray that if it's God's will to keep me in weakness, I would rejoice in my infirmities in order that the power of Christ might rest upon me. As it turned out, I had to get within one inch of the microphone just to croak the gospel, quote, unquote. Jesus loves you. That's all he can say. I was unable to use any inflection of voice to express my personality. It was just a croak in a monotonous voice and all the time we're crying out to God for his power to be demonstrated in human weakness. Well, John Stock say, I can honestly say that there was a far greater response that night than any other night. I have been back to Australia 10 times since that night. And John Stock said, on every occasion, somebody would come up to me and say, do you remember that night when you lost your voice? Well, I was converted on that night. Can someone say, amen. Human weakness. But the power of God is being manifested. You know, a few Sundays ago, Pastor Benny was here preaching on our Sunday service, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. And Pastor Benny, as he always does, preached a fantastic sermon. He ended with a poem. I was very surprised that our people, you are so cultured. Because at the end of that day, I saw many of you posted that poem on your social media. So today, in order to not be outdone by Pastor Benny, to show you I'm also very cultured. I also drink tea with my little finger in the air. And I also love to talk about the weather. I too am going to read you a poem. This poem is called The Prayer of an Unknown Confederate Soldier. Fantastic poem. Check this out. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I may feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I received nothing that I asked for, but all that I hoped for 
I am among all men most richly blessed. Praise God. We learn to trust in God. We learn to dwell in the presence of God. Now, perhaps some of you here, the truth about us this morning is that we keep focusing on things that we cannot do. Perhaps some of you here are new parent. You have children and things are tough and you keep focusing on what you cannot do. Say, oh, I have two kids. I have three kids. I have a lot of children. It's tough. I want to do more for God, but I cannot do a lot for God. If only my children are more mature, if only my children are grown up, if only I have no children, then I can go about doing more for God. Then I can go about loving neighbours, making disciples, planting churches. Or maybe some of you here, the truth about you is that you are in a very difficult job right now. You're working in Singapore. Some of you are working overseas and job is tough. You got to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every single day. And you are thinking to yourself, the song you keep singing to yourself is this, if only I have an easier job, if only I have been promoted, if only I have a special skill set, if only I come from a richer family, then I can do more for God. Then I can truly go about loving neighbours, making disciples, planting churches. Or perhaps some of you, the truth about you is that you have a physical ailment and you're thinking to yourself, if only my body is stronger, I can think faster, I am more mobile, I can walk, I can use my hands, then I can go about doing more for God. I can go about loving neighbours, making disciples, planting churches, I can do more of that. Or perhaps some of you, you're sitting down here, you're thinking to yourself, if only I'm more spiritually gifted. If only I can speak by some of the leaders around me. If only I can sing like the worship leader in our church. If only I can prophesy. If only I have the word of knowledge. If only I can lead better, then I can do more for God. You know what God is saying to all of us here this morning? God is saying this, stop focusing on what you cannot do and start focusing on what God can and will do in and through all of us. Can someone say amen? Because at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about what we have or what we don't have. It had always been, it is, and it will always be about God working through each and every one of us. The witness of weakness. Stop focusing on what you cannot do. Because if you were to focus on what you cannot do, we go down a thrill where there is no end. There's a thousand and one things that we cannot do and we will never be able to do. Look at what God has built in our church today. It is God's work. Can someone say amen? If you look at myself, if I look at the people around me, this couldn't have happened. It is God's work from the beginning until the end. Stop focusing on what you cannot do and stop. Start focusing on what God can do in spite of our weakness. God can do great things through us. Let me show you a testimony of Chu Ming. Chu Ming is here today. All right, let's give him a big hand. In 2008, Chu Ming was diagnosed with a rare form of spinal muscular atrophy called the Kennedy's disease. This is in 2008. Initially, he was given only 18 months to live. This is 2019. The way I see him, I think he is still very much alive. Can someone say amen? As a result of this disease, Chu Ming could not take up many acting roles as he used to because of his immobility. I remember during those days where Chu Ming wasn't getting much acting roles, he was having a tough time in terms of his career. He kept telling us, Claudia and myself, as well as the celebrities, that he will continue to focus on God and he will continue to serve God. Instead of focusing on his weakness, Chu Ming has decided to focus on God. In fact, it was during that 
difficult period that Chu Ming started a live group to serve the celebrities. As he focused on God, God lifted him up. God gave him new roles and recently he was awarded the Special Achievement Award where he shared on national television of his gratitude to God and to the people that helped him. It was certainly one of the best highlights of the entire evening. Through Chu Ming witness, the power of God can be clearly seen through his life. Let's give Jesus, let's give Chu Ming and Dion, let's give them a big, big hand. Come on, people. Praise God. See, our dream is this. Our dream is this. Our dream is that when people come to our movement, to our church, when they look at us, they'll be not so much impressed with our conference, with our services, with our strategy, with our leaders. Now, don't get me wrong. These are great things. Nothing wrong with these things. As far as conference is concerned, as far as services is concerned, we want to do even better. We want to have the spirit of excellence. Instead of strategy, we want to become crystal clear so that everybody is crystal clear. They know how to move from step A to step B to step C to step D and grow to become more like Jesus in every season of their life. In terms of our leaders, we honour our leaders highly. Can someone give me a good amen? We love our leaders, we honour our leaders because they are God chosen. But in the midst of all these things, as great as they are, at the end of the day, what we really want people to see, what we really want people to focus on is Jesus. Let the world see Jesus in the midst of our weakness, they are able to witness the power of Christ. That's the first thing we can learn. Second thing I want to unpack to you from these six verses. Number two, we are able to let the world see Jesus by helping them experience the life of Christ through our obedience. Help the watching world around us come to a place where they are able to experience the life of Jesus Christ through our obedience to Him. Well, from verse 10 to verse 12, let me read for us. Paul presented a series of paradoxes. Let me explain to us. Let, let's look at verse 10. Paul said this, We always carry around in our body, look at what he said, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. The death, the life. Verse 11, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that His life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Verse 12. Let's read together, shall we? The Bible says everybody in full voice. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. So what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying here this. Paul is saying that just as Jesus died to give us life, the Apostle Paul is also learning to endure hardship and also learning to die to himself a little bit more on a daily basis such that the people around him can begin to experience the life of Christ. Even though most of us, we may not have to go through the same level of hardship the Apostle Paul went through, but all of us, we all can from one day to another, live in greater obedience to Christ today than it was yesterday. We all can learn to die a little bit more of ourselves today than it was yesterday so that the people around us, they're able to experience the life of Christ. That's what the Bible is telling us. I've heard many testimonies of people in our movement People who step out in faith, they trusted God, they walked in faith, they obeyed God, and as a result of your obedience, many life groups, many churches were planted. One such example, her name is Jeline. Jeline is here this morning. Jeline and a few around her pioneered the first life group in Bukit Timah Zone. She was then a part of a life group in the Red Hill Zone where she had many good friends around her. 
but she obeyed God by stepping out of her comfort zone to pioneer the life group in Bukit Timah. Since then, many lives have been touched and transformed. In fact, one of the cool things about Jolene is that when she stepped out to serve as a life group leader then, her husband, Jerry, was not even a believer as yet. But Jolene's conviction was this. She said that she cannot wait for Jerry before she stepped forth to obey God. She believed that as she obeyed God and moved forward, God will work in Jerry's life and bring him to join her to serve God together. Now, my friend, Jerry had already come to faith in Jesus Christ and they are both serving together in the life group. Come on, let's give Jolene and Jerry a big, big hand. Praise God. Because of your obedience, many lives have been touched. Many of you here who have taken the step to move into step D, the mentors and the life group leader, I want to publicly affirm you. I want to thank you for walking in obedience because of your obedience. Many lives have been touched. Many lives have been transformed. Let's give all our mentors and life group leader, let's give them a big hand. Come on, people. Come on, let's show them some love. Woo! You know, recently, the big thing that happened in this small island is this event called Celebration of Hope. I'm sure some of you know that, especially those of you who live in this country. There were many testimonies that I've heard about different people crossing the line of faith to know Jesus. One of the testimony that really touched me was about a group that was reaching out to the pimps and the prostitute in the Geylang area. This is the red light district in Singapore. This group obeyed God and loved the people that were not easy to love and generally not very accepted in society. On the Saturday night, during the Mandarin rally, 20 of them, the pimps, the pimp rather, and her workers, and sorry, the, I'm getting a bit confused with gender right here, okay? The Pim and his workers, 20 of them, they walk from the Geylang area to the National Stadium. It's quite close together, actually. They decided to come even though it was their prime working hour on a Saturday night. At the end of the service, the Pim and his wife both came to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to read to you the text that I received all right, in a chat group that I'm in. It's going to be in Mandarin, so the rest of you don't understand Mandarin too bad, okay? Thank Tata,他的太太是一个很虔诚的XX图啊,something Woo. Because of some people's obedience, the hardest of the hardest of hearts can come to a place where they come to know Jesus. Can someone say amen? Nothing is impossible for God. Through our obedience, the world can witness the power of God. They can witness the life of Christ. Now, some of you here, now listen up. Some of you here, perhaps the truth about you is that you're feeling a little bit discouraged. You're feeling a little bit disappointed because there was a time, perhaps the last conference you were here and you heard the challenge from God and you say, God, I'm going to walk out in obedience. I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to trust you. As you take the step of faith, you expected God to change many lives. You expected God to bring about much fruits. But today you are here, the truth about you is that you are feeling a little bit disappointed. You say, God, I gave so much, but the fruits that came back, 
It's so little. Or perhaps some of you here, you step forth to try to help people, to love Jesus, to see their life transform. Instead of being appreciated, you got lump blasted on many fronts. You're feeling a little bit disheartened right now because instead of being appreciated, you got all sorts of nonsense from the people around you and you are here today. Truth be told, my friend, is that you are only here today because someone forced you to come. And you're just sitting here. Perhaps some of you could even come from overseas. You fly all the way on the plane. Your only prayer is this, God, why am I here? Why am I here? Why am I here? Or perhaps some of you hear the truth about you that you are here today and the only resolution in your heart right now is this, God, I'm going to give you one last chance. This is the last conference I'm ever going to come. At least no one can accuse me of not doing my all. I'm just giving you my last time. God knows what you're going through, my friends. But I want to share this with you, friends. No matter what happens around you, no matter what people can say, no matter what situation can happen, no matter what disheartening, thing, disheartening words can be aimed at you, we all have a choice to make. We can always choose to not let anything stop us from our full devotion and complete surrender to God. Can someone say amen? amen. Things can happen to us. Situation can happen to us, but we must never ever let anything distract us and detract us from the destiny that God has for each and every one of us. You always have a choice and we must never, ever let any happening stop us from our full devotion and complete surrender to God. You know, this sermon has taken me more than eight months to prepare. Since we launched out as a new movement on the 1st of October, 2018, there have been many things in both my head and in my heart. Even though before we launched out as a movement, we were already a global movement, but with this new launch, we now have got new countries to plant churches in. And God has very graciously opened many doors for us. In this conference, I know of people who come from Laos, people who come from Sri Lanka, people who come from Venezuela. They are here. God has opened doors for all of us. And I've learned this. I've learned that everything that we do here in this little island it's not meant for just ourselves. It may start here, but the repercussion, the effect is going to go around the entire globe and back. And I share very openly with you that God wants us to be the Antioch of Antiochs. And in order to be an Antioch that is worth replicating and reproducing, we've got to make sure we get it right. And that is why for the past few months, there's been many things in my head and in my heart and for reasons still unknown to me for the past many months I've been having recurring nightmares not every night about one to two times every single week this is what happened in the night in the daytime if you have a term for it you can call it day man I struggle with this consistent sense of feeling inadequate uncertain and weak that's how I feel all the time for the past eight months now. Some of you now, just put a little pause. Some of you, while you're hearing this, maybe some of you who are a little bit, in my use of the word, are still in your thinking. Say, hey, maybe it's not God's will for us to launch out as a movement. Now, let me say it in no unclear terms. Listen and listen up well. This whole decision to launch out as a movement is a spirit-led decision. The pastors and I, we have no doubt, not a single trace of doubt that this is the right decision. And just because it is difficult does not mean that it is not God's will. In fact, oftentimes, precisely because it is God's will, that is why it is difficult, isn't it true? 
Because God will never give us a vision that we can accomplish on our own. If it's truly God's vision, it always involves God. We can never complete and fulfill God's vision apart from God. Such that when all is said and done, only God and God alone will get all the glory. Can someone give me a good amen? So this vision is definitely from God. Now, listen, even though I feel weak, even though I struggle in the daytime, I don't sleep very well in the night, but I want to let you know this. I continue to obey God. I continue to walk in His ways. I continue to be faithful, to lead, to preach, and to fulfill all the different assignments that God had very graciously given to me. Now, the best thing that happened out of all this uncertainty, inadequacy, insecurity, fear and weakness, the best thing that happened out of all these things is this. It draws me closer and closer to Jesus Christ. And that, my friend, is the best thing. I have now come, honestly, to a fresh and new understanding of what the Apostle Paul said in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said this, that is why I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. I will boast about how weak I am. And then the next verse, in verse 10, he said, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight, I am happy, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulty. Why? Come on, help me. For everybody, when I am weak, full voice please, then I am strong. Until and unless you come to a point where you know that you are weak, then you can never be strong. For when I am weak, then I can be strong. Apparently, God's strength is attracted to human weakness. You know, we have a group of prophetic painters in our church. Even before they know what I'm going to preach on, they started painting a couple of months ago. I want to show you the first painting. Just one painting today, please. This is a painting painted by someone who didn't know I'm going to preach this. He said that as I paint this visual, I think about the people who are broken at times. Maybe some of us, maybe like me. Those who are crushed and wounded, but yet we still allow ourselves to be used by God to be carrier of His light. God show His grace and make us whole in our brokenness to be a vessel of blessing and love, brothers and sisters. You know, God walked through us Precisely because we are weak, we are able to let the world see Jesus. We are able to come to a place, we say, God, it's no longer about me, it's truly, truly all about you. It's such a paradox. I have never ever felt so weak and yet I have never ever felt more confident in God. I believe with my whole heart that the God who started this movement He's going to bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Can someone say Amen? I believe with all my heart, God's going to continue to grow this movement out of Singapore to the ends of the earth such that the glory of God shall fill the earth as the water covers the seas. Let's stand together right now, shall we? All over this place.